What's up everybody? So a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago now, I don't really remember the timeline, I was speaking with Ken Kratz and we were going to do a question and answer type video series for my YouTube channel. But after doing the first video, I realized I just didn't have the time to put into it uh, to be able to make them the way I wanted to. And instead of wasting everybody's time, Ken Kratz is included, I just decided to end it. Just because I didn't want to do half a job. I didn't want it to come off that uh, I wasn't really putting everything into it just because I didn't have the time. So I reached back out to Ken Kratz, I explained it to him, I gave him a couple of options of things that I thought he should do. I, I thought that he should start his own YouTube channel and do the videos on there, answering people's questions himself, because then he can control his own narrative. He can he can decide what's said. He can decide what's posted. I suggested that he reach out to somebody else, possibly, and do the question and answer videos with them. So here's where we are. Ken Kratz did start a YouTube channel. I will link it in the description below. He has posted a couple of videos so far. I have not had the chance to check them out, but I'm definitely going to. And I don't know who reached out to who, but someone on X and Ken Kratz are going to be doing the question and answer. Uh, they're not doing the video portion. I am doing the video portion. So Vegas Ranger on X, I will link their X account in the description below. They are going to be doing the question and answer documents with Ken Kratz. They are going to be sending Ken Kratz the questions. Ken Kratz is going to be doing the answers. They're going to have their back and forth and then they're going to send them to me and then I'm going to read them on this channel, my channel. Uh, that is the agreement that we have come to. This is the easy part for me. It was doing all of the other stuff that I just didn't have time to. If we had done this process like this since the beginning, I never would have stopped it, but I just didn't have time to do the question the back and forth and then do the videos as well so doing the videos is the easy part for me it doesn't really take a ton of time for me to do these types of videos other types of videos of course take much longer but these type don't really take that much time I really enjoy doing them and uh, if we keep going like this I there's no uh, I won't be stopping I'll keep doing these videos just like this so Vegas Ranger on X Twitter handle, X handle, linked in the description below. Sent Ken Kratz five questions, or at least I have received back five questions and five answers from Ken Kratz and Vegas Ranger. Now, they both emailed me this document, which is good, and I looked at it just to see. You never know. I looked at it just to see, and they did send me the exact same thing, so we are off to a tremendous start. So these are Vegas Ranger questions, and I th I'm going to put everything up on the screen so you guys can have a view for yourself of everything that I'm seeing and also so you just don't have to stare at me for the next however many minutes this video is. So question number one. I'm still not entirely sure how to say this person's last name. Uh, I'm just going to spell it out. Have you listened to the Z-I-P-P-E-R-E-R? -E -E is it zipper -er? Er, voicemail and if so what did it say now he, they put up a document here the Calumet County Sheriff's Department like you can see it on the screen it shows uh, let's see interview of Joe Ellen Zipper -er, er, uh, Z I P P E R E R date of activity 11605 reporting officer John Deedering Deedering uh, documents generated as you can see there put it up on the screen now here is what Ken Kratz had to say in regards to that he states I did not listen to the voicemail to the best of my recollection why did he not listen to that voicemail I wonder maybe he will answer it here I have attached the Columet County Sheriff's Department reports that are relevant to this topic. On November 6, 2005, CCSD John Dietering met with George and Joe Ellen Zipperer. At their residence, both were interviewed by John. Joe Ellen told John that although she had not spoken to Teresa on the phone, she, Teresa Halbach, did leave a voicemail message indicating she could not find the residence at 9.30 a.m. on November the 6th, 2005. 
at 9.30 a.m. on 11605, Detective Dennis Jacobs from the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department received permission to record the voicemail onto his phone. Jacobs later told John that the recording would be transferred to a CD. She also recalled Teresa was at her residence at approximately 2.30 p.m. and that she was wearing jeans later to be determined to be Daisy Fuentes brand. Now, why would you not want to listen to what evidently could have possibly been Teresa Halbach's last words. doesn't really matter what they said, or it could matter a great deal what that voicemail said. Nobody knows, because apparently Ken Krantz didn't listen to it. But why would you not want to listen to what was possibly Teresa Halbach's last words? That seems like it may have been a pretty big deal. Maybe she said something in that voicemail. That seems like something you would definitely want to listen to. It was something I would definitely want to listen to. I wonder if there's any possible way to get that voicemail. Is that voicemail out there? I don't know. Maybe some of you can tell me that. If it is out there, let me know. If it's not out there, where is it? And how do you think we can get a copy of it if it is possible? Question number two. If not, why didn't you request to listen given the importance of it and the fact it was listed in your documents. Maybe we'll get the answer here. And this is what Ken Krantz had to say. It's John listened to the voicemail, so it is not unknown what was said. Okay. At 2153 hours, I was allowed into the ZIP residence. I did review voicemail messages left on the answering machine and caller IDs. I did locate a caller ID entry on 10-31-05 at 2-12 p.m. from phone number 920-737-4731. I recognized this as being the cellular phone number of Teresa Halbach. I did review the voicemail messages and did locate a voicemail message from Teresa Halbach indicating that she was calling on Monday about 2-15 p.m. She stated she was in the neighborhood and she was trying to photograph a 1977 Pontiac Firebird. She stated that she was having problems finding the residence and hoped to do so in the next few minutes. I had been allowed access to the residence by both Joe Ellen and George. It should be noted that this voicemail message or answering machine message was subsequently copied by Detective Jacobs on Sunday, 11605. In speaking with Joe Ellen, date of birth 71546, she stated she was in the backyard and apparently missed the telephone call that Teresa Halbach placed. She stated some Sometime in the afternoon, a young lady did come to the residence and advised that she was from the auto trader and that there and was there to photograph a vehicle. She indicated she gave the young lady directions to where the car described as a 1977 Firebird had been located, and the girl had come back between 5 and 10 minutes later, indicating that she had gotten her pictures. Joe Ellen advised the girl. Joe Ellen advised the girl was happy and smiling. Uh, Mrs. Miss Zipperer indicated that she did not see what vehicle, if any, the young lady had arrived in, nor could she tell me whether the young lady had arrived by herself or with someone else. Joe in jo Ellen indicated she could not determine which direction the young lady traveled on CTHB when she left as she never actually seen the vehicle the young lady arrived in. She called approximately 2.15 p.m. saying she was having a hard time finding the residence. Question number three from Vegas Ranger, why wasn't it disclosed to the defense or played to the jury? Our, this is Ken Kratz's answer. Our office made every effort to copy and provide the defense everything we had in our office. That's the best discovery procedure, as I made no attempt to hide anything from them. To this day, I, f I believe full disclosure and transparency is the only way to run a governmental office of any kind, especially in a DA's office. The attorneys were invited to review all of their discovery and compare it to our lists. They were required to come meet Meet with me personally and review all of the evidence being held at the sheriff's department. That was done so 
no claim could later be made we didn't know about it. That's in, we didn't know about it is in quotation marks. Of the thousands of pages of police and crime lab reports, including CDs made of data statements, jail calls, and photos, it appears the DA's office did not have the voicemail and the VLCD containing a summary of data analyzed on the DASI computer. To this date, no attorney has provided any evidence that either of these CDs were withheld intentionally. In fact, no showing has been made that either would be relevant or admissible. It is not uncommon for exoneration attorneys to look for what evidence may have been overlooked or not part of the original trial, especially untested items to provide a new factor hoping to win a second trial. Every effort made by Stephen Avery's original appellate attorneys and now attorney Kathleen Zellner have failed, not only to get a new trial, but even to get a hearing before the circuit court. This is question number four. Did you know about the change of statement made by Remiker, R-E-M-I-K-E-R, -E -E originally on the November 4th, he said Stephen stated she was on the property, then he changed it on the 15th of November to Stephen indicated to me that Teresa did come into his residence. Did you tell him not to bring it up in trial, only for him to do so in error? And let's see what Ken Kratz responded with. He states, the detective originally indicated the Avery admitted. That was probably supposed to be that Avery admitted to Teresa Halbach being on the property on October 31st, 2005, and later adding Avery specifically said she was inside his trailer is not an inconsistent statement. All witnesses, police officers included, are asked to expand on their answers contained in original reports. Then the tier of fact, the jury listens and decides how much of the statement they believe. What a weird concept. Weighing the credibility of witnesses is the most important job of a jury. Whether you agree or disagree with their determination, their view of the evidence and witnesses is all that matters. Avery provided many inconsistent statements about where Teresa went while on the ASY, Avery Selvage Yard, the afternoon of October 31st. They all would have been used to impeach Stephen Avery should he have elected to testify. And the final question of this video, number five, if you didn't know about it, why not? And were you aware Cam was going to use it as evidence against Stephen Avery? even although it was never admitted into evidence. Number five, the producer of CAM, Brenda Schuler, admitted she hadn't talked with me for the past five years and has no intent to do so. I feel like there was a pretty bad falling out there. They even have NDAs, which is bizarre considering the reason why these NDA exists. Brenda Schuler wrote something to me on X Attempting to explain, like I didn't already know, I mean, she just assumes most people probably don't know anything. I, I don't really know why she would assume that, but she does, or at least did in this case. She explained to me why NDAs exist, but that's not why they exist in their specific situation, which is very interesting why she came out to be like, this is why NDAs exist. This is why NDAs exist. I know why NDAs exist, but that is not why they exist in your situation, which is very interesting. Someday we will discuss the details of CAM, what obvious errors they made, and what was left out. For now, ask yourself why the producer of this 10-hour series thought she could accurately recreate what happened in this complex criminal case without speaking to the lead prosecutor. And more puzzling, why did she choose to exclude all of the exclusive prosecution materials given? Interesting. Interesting. I wonder what Sean... I wonder if Sean Reck has anything to say about that. I wonder why they excluded all kinds of exclusive prosecution materials. Interesting. Exclusive, which would lead you to believe that they weren't in making a murder. They weren't 
in anything else since. I mean, that's what exclusive means. It's like for these people only. I wonder what that is. I wonder if Vegas Ranger could possibly get these exclusive prosecution materials for his question and answers. That would be very interesting. But yeah, the big thing for me is I don't know why you wouldn't have, maybe, maybe there's nothing there. Maybe it's just like, hey, I'm having a hard time finding this place. Why wouldn't you want to listen to the last voicemail? That seems like it would be very interesting. Like even for your own curiosity as lead prosecutor, what does this say? Does this include something important? And if not, you can just disregard it. It's not like it would be a super long voicemail. What, like 30 seconds, maybe tops? Probably not even that. But we'll, we'll never know. Or maybe we will know. Maybe that voicemail's out there somewhere. Maybe it's already been played. I would like to hear it because I don't believe I've heard it. At least I don't recall hearing it. Or if I did, I, I, just, I just don't remember. But is it out there? Is there a possibility that we could get it? I'm interested. Let me know. Leave some comments below. I hope you're having a good day, and I will see you again soon.